her kingdom Greer the second and this is um, this first song we're going to play it's it's called promises um, I would like to ask if the Reverend Matthew could go home after this song because uh, I feel as if this song is a sermon unto itself um, so just listen to it if you know it sing along but if you don't just listen God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proved to just what you said. Though the storm may come and the wind may blow, while we
Good morning, Maple Avenue, and welcome to worship with us. As we continue in our worship, we uh, give praise to God for what God has done in our lives. And we also recognize that we come to this place a little bit broken. And for that, we, uh, we acknowledge the ways in which we are broken to God and ask for forgiveness. So would you pray with me? God, in Jesus Christ, you called us to be a servant people, but we do not always do what you have commanded of us. We are often silent when we should speak and useless when we should be useful. Have mercy on us, O oh God, for we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we have ought to done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. God, have mercy on us. Restore us who are penitent according to your promises declared to the world in Christ Jesus. God, you love us, but we do not always love you fully. For that and for so much more, we are sorry and we repent of our ways to walk in your ways that you have put forth before us. God, thank you for the ways in which you are faithful and loving and kind and gracious, even when we are not. Help us to live in ways that honor you and your grace and your love and your kindness. Amen. Friends, we do know that God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And so, as far as the east is from the west, that is how far God removes our transgressions from us. Thanks be to God. Amen. And friends, when, we, when God removes this, this sin from us, we receive the peace of Christ. And so now I invite you to pass that peace that is only from God to one another. Here in the sanctuary, feel free to move about as you are comfortable with high fives, hugs, fist bumps, waves. And to those of you joining us online, we encourage you to comment in the Facebook comments, to say hello to any around you, to shoot a text or give someone a call. May the Lord be with you.
I learned something interesting this uh, past year, two years, I believe, that um, even in times of chaos, God is still working. He, 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 he still loves, even though it, uh, it still might be a reckless love. You see, you see what I did there? Um, but yeah, it, it, it was tough to realize when I was in the midst of finding out what is happening in my world that God is still working. He's still loving. Oh, how he loves.
May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his face upon us and may the Lord give us peace. In that spirit, let us go to God in prayer. God, today, would you continue to bless us? Bless us with sunshine and rain. Bless us with green grass and flowers of all colors. Bless us with faces around us who show us your love and kindness. God, continue to bless us as you have from the beginning. God, would you keep us? Would you keep us by protecting us guarding us, holding us. God, in, in particular, would you keep the Brower family as they grieved the death of Ross's father? Would you keep Ross and Krista and Ross's mom and the entire family God, would you keep Grandma Maggie, who had a fall this week and hurt her hip? God, would you keep her and protect her and heal her? God, would you keep Matthew J. Warfield? as he moves to Ann Arbor this week to begin a ministry there? Would you hold him and guide him in his pastorship? God, would you keep those among this church and in this community who are struggling in their marriages and in their friendships, in the relationships with family. God, would you hold them close in these tender spaces? God, would you keep those who are battling illnesses, cancer and Alzheimer's and COVID and the list goes on. God, would you keep them in their homes, in the hospitals, in urgent care, God, would you hold them and heal them? God, would you be gracious to us? Gracious to us in ways that we do not deserve. God, would you continue to work in us so that in these frail and human bodies that your work may somehow be done. And God, would you continue to make your face shine upon us and turn it our way? God, we know that Any power, any kindness, any strength or courage or love or grace 
is a reflection of the light, the shining of your face that has turned toward us. And God, would you give us your peace? Would you bestow upon us, would you wrap us in the shalom, in the flourishing, the thriving, the all is wellness that only you can give in places like Haiti, and Afghanistan. In this global pandemic in every corners of the earth. And God, here in this church, would you wrap us in a peace that is so great and so filled with love and grace and patience and kindness, a peace that surpasses all understanding. And God, for all those things that have gone unsaid by my own words, but have stirred in our hearts here in this place and online, God, would, would you hear our prayers? Would you turn that shining face towards us? Bend an ear and listen to the cries, concerns, hopes, and praises of our hearts. It is in your great and gracious name that we pray. Amen. Well, mammally. We have a few announcements this morning. Um, the first of which is that this past Tuesday, uh, myself, the consistory, and Pastor Jill from Hope Church, who is serving as a sort of liaison at the moment, uh, gathered for our monthly consistory meeting. And you can read both here in um, the bulletin and uh, for those of you joining us online in the email blast that went out on Thursday, kind of an update about what is going on here at Maple Ave during this time of transition. I'd like to highlight the, the last three points um, in the immediate next steps. Uh, we, as the consistory, um, are committed in this, these next few weeks to contact, engage, and engage in conversation with all of the MAMLY members um, who have yet to fill out that MAM Next Step survey. Uh, we understand that not everybody wants to go online and fill something out, or, and so we'd love to have a conversation with you if, if that is not you. And so um, we have a list of those of you who haven't filled it out, but if you'd like to fill it out, feel free to, um, and then don't be surprised if you get a follow-up email or phone call from a member of the consistory. Uh, we also decided um, to research and proceed with finding some interim consulting options in place of uh, hiring an interim pastor. In the meantime, we in this congregation are just incredibly blessed by people like Matthew and uh, others who um, are sharing their gifts of preaching and pastoring during this time. And so um, we are looking for uh, interim consulting services to help us during this transition in um, thinking through questions about who are we um, and what is next for us so that we can begin to put together a job description and begin the pastoral search. Um, in order to do this, we are seeking funding from people who have already, or people, institutions, places, that have already reached out to us in support um, and offered 
um, financial support and other support. And so um, that includes the classes of both the RCA and the CRC here in Holland, as well as a variety of church partners. And so we will be um, putting together some grant proposals for that funding. Um, if you have any questions about any of this, please feel free to reach out. Um, I, myself, or any member of the consistory would love to sit down and talk with you or answer your email and any uh, questions and concerns you might have. Uh, we also have been going strong on our midweek prayers. I continue to invite you to join me in prayer, both here at church and there's um, availability during Zoom or on Zoom uh, Tuesday nights at 8:30. Wednesday mornings at 8.30, and Thursdays at 12.30. Um, we are coming together as a congregation to pray for one another, for this church, for our community, and for the world. And uh, it truly has been a time of um, blessing for me. So thank you for those of you who have joined us. And I invite um, everyone to join us as well. Uh, there are a variety of ways that we'd love to invite uh, any and all people within the MAM to participate with us. One of those is to join the MAM tech team. Uh, whether or not you have experience in auto, audio engineering or PowerPoint or streaming, uh, our team can train you and will train you. And so um, we extend this invitation to anyone. We had uh, a young uh, boy volunteer and will be joining the team soon. Um, and uh, no age is too young or too old to, to learn these things. But we'd also like to invite you, we, we need help in ushering and in the nursery. Uh, we'd also love to invite you to be part of our worship, whether it's singing or dancing or playing. Um, we all always, but especially during this time of transition, um, desire to be together, always together. And so if you um, are interested in serving in any of the ways I've mentioned, or if you have other gifts and talents um, that could be used elsewhere, we would love to hear from you and participate with you. Um, one more note is that you can see here in the bulletin the upcoming Mammoli preachers that we have coming uh, in the coming weeks, which we are so excited about this lineup. And today we have the incredible privilege to hear from Math the Reverend, the Reverend Matthew Warfield Jr. Um, for those of you who may not know, Matthew grew up here at MAM um, has been an incredible, an incredibly faithful person in, in the mam in Mammoly history here. And um, Matthew and I had the privilege of going to seminary together and being in class with, with one another, uh, learning in Hebrew the blessing we just sang. And, um, and this week, he is moving to Ann Arbor to... Um, take up a pastorship at, at a church there in a fellows program for two years. And so, Matthew, we are just, I'm so excited for you personally. And I know here at the MAM, we celebrated your ordination a few weeks back, and we are just so excited for you. Um, and even as you go from the, this place, know that you do not go alone. God goes with you, and we go together. And so we are excited to have you as Mammoly over there with Mark Mata's other Mammoly in Ann Arbor um, doing your thing and doing the Lord's work. And so um, blessings, friend. You're up. That was a good introduction. Thank you, Emily. Appreciate that. Um, so it is good to be home. Uh, it's a blessing. I grew up here, as she said. And those very pews that we're all sitting in and preaching and praying and playing basketball on the lot and 
getting in trouble, and a lot of things happened at this particular place. Uh, and it's so great uh, as Christopher, just seeing Christopher lead worship. Uh, I remember when Christopher was a baby, uh, and now he's leading the people of God in worship. So it's a great thing to see the faithfulness of God. Uh, he is indeed faithful. Um, so this morning, I have the opportunity to come and preach to you all. Um, so before I preach, though, um, I want to do a prayer of illumination. So if you bow your heads with me, I'd be extremely grateful. Today I ask you to search me, O oh God, and know my heart and try me and see if there is any destructive way in me. And when you find what is not pleasing, O oh God, I ask that you take it away from me and you cast it into the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west and that it will never return again. Lord, I thank you for the privilege to stand behind the sacred desk. I am intimately aware that I am not worthy to preach your word. Yet I am grateful that I can stand behind this pulpit even as a broken vessel, not because I am anything, but because I have received your unmerited grace. Lord, I ask that you might send the angel by the name of grace and the angel by the name of mercy so that grace and mercy might surround this pulpit. Lord, allow me to decrease that your word might increase and go forth and not return void. Lord, I ask that you enter into each and every one of us and remove anything that keeps us from seeing you. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that you open our hearts that we may be fertile and God, that we might be able to hear what you're saying today, Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the, and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, you are my strength and without a doubt, you are surely my redeemer, you are my rock, you are my salvation. Holy Spirit, do thy will. Do thy will, Holy Spirit, in the mighty, magnificent, all-powerful name of Jesus the Christ, we pray, and the people of God who love God, amen. amen. Today we read from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Therefore, as God, oh, I'm sorry. So I've been serving at a congregation, and here I love that we stand in reverence and honoring of the word. So everyone's standing now. Uh, the words will be up there. I'm sorry a little quick there, um, but let's get to the scripture. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as God forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. This is the word of God. So for the last several months, I, I've been wrestling with this, this concept of uh, what is the beloved community? Uh, how can we accomplish this, this beloved community? Uh, this notion, this idea was pop popularized by uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, he looked at the status quo and recognized that it was inconsistent with the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, but what he did there, then he, he deeply meditated on the, the prayer that Jesus offered in particular, the, the, the line that says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Therefore, he believed, but... He, he didn't stop there. He, he believed that if the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, poured out on us, that, that we could indeed kind of foster and, and, and create this beloved community that, that with the work of the Spirit we, and this work of love, that, that we could be a society that was filled with justice and, and equal opportunity and, and love for all of humanity. Uh, one of the the things when he encountered the scripture, he, he, he saw this, this overwhelming theme of love. He said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And amidst all the violence, uh, Dr. King said that we have to be people of love. And, and, but this seemed foolish because how, how can love ov overcome hate? How, how can we, we do this thing? And, and he believed that if we had this commitment to, to love and, and to compassion and, and to kindness, that, that the world might think it is foolish, but that this love and, and this compassion and, and this kindness could, could transform the world. This, this thing that they considered foolish was not indeed foolish, but it, it was the, kingdom, the way of the kingdom of God. 
uh, he believed that if we, we clothe ourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility and gentleness and patience and forgiveness and love, that we could, in fact, change the world. So when speaking of the beloved community, Dr. King said, but the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is a type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends. This type of love that I stress here is not arrows, a, a sort of aesthetic or romantic love, not philia, a, a sort of reciprocal or, or friendly love, but it is agape, which is understanding goodwill for all people. It is an overflowing love which speaks, seeks nothing in return. It is the love of God working in the lives of people. This is the love that may well be the, sev- the salvation of our civilization. And this is where we encounter the text. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, probably while in prison. Uh, in this letter, Price, Price, Paul is proclaiming uh, Christ's supreme power of the universe, and he's urging his brothers, sisters, to live godly lives. Chapter 3 in particular focuses on the guidelines for Christian living, showing the old self in comparison to the, the new self, the, the old way of living, uh, to, to the new way of living that becomes possible by Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so as we look at this belief of the beloved community, uh, how could this be made possible? We, we have to hone in on the words that Paul spoke to this church in Colossae. He, he said that uh, we have to put on or, or clothe ourselves with, with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience and forgiveness, and most importantly, love. One thing I can say but beyond a shadow of doubt is that growing up in this church, I learned that the way of Christianity is the way of love. Uh, uh, deeply embedded in our, our way of life is this concept of reconciliation, being reconciled to one another, but mainly reconciled to God, but there can be no reconciliation with God yet if I don't be reconciled with my brother and or sister. So deeply rooted in my theology, deeply rooted in my ideology, deeply rooted in who mam has made me be, deeply rooted in this concept of the mamly, it's this, it's this reconciliation. And the way reconciliation can take place is being rooted in love, being rooted in kindness and, and compassion and, and gentleness and, and humility and this is the way, and, and forgiveness. Reconciliation doesn't happen without forgiveness being a part of our, our, our identity. But when we look at Paul in, in this particular chapter, he talks about putting on it, like making it a part of you. So before I got here, I was wearing a, a clothing. But, but when, I, when, I, when I put this clothing in, I, I sinked into it. This, this, this robe that I have, this, this preaching robe, I'm in it. It's, you can barely see what I'm wearing. It's, it's a part of me. It, it almost becomes where it's a part of my essence. You can't fully know what's going on underneath here. Thankfully, it's hiding a couple pounds. Um, but uh, putting on this garment, is, the garment becomes you. It, it becomes, there becomes no distinction. So what I'm wearing becomes identifiable with myself. That is one reason why, why folk tell people when they're going to an interview to put on a shirt and a tie and maybe some slacks and, and, and maybe some nice shoes because it represents something about you. So this, this garment putting on this stuff shows a, a picture of, of what, we are, what we are. So that, that, that's kind of the concept. So in, in order to this thing I've been wrestling with, this, this thing that this church has been and will continue to be, this beloved community concept, we, we have to be committed to it. And in order to be committed to it, we have to walk in these, these things that Paul highlights. He highlights and he says uh, that we have to be clothed, we have to put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and the thing that unifies them all, the thing that brings them all together, is love. So one of the things I want to do here, um, and I, we talked, she talked about seminary, uh, what we learned in seminary is kind of go to the root of the word. So what I'm going to do here next is talk about 
uh, give a fuller picture of the, the meaning of what some of these words might, might be when we go to, to, the, to the Greek. Um, so when we look at compassion, uh, this compassion that we're supposed to be clothed with, uh, it, it emphasizes having a deep feeling about someone's difficulty uh, or their misfortune. It's having a desire to relieve sorrow. Uh, it highlights being gracious and, and merciful. Uh, when we look at this notion of kindness we are, that we're supposed to be clothed with, it, it connotates uprightness and, and moral goodness and, and integrity and being honest in all things. And, and we are unable to do this, though, without the work of the Spirit. One thing I, I want to highlight through all, all this thing I'm talking about, through all these, these clothing and these, these garments that we're putting on is that none of it is possible without the work of the Holy Spirit and, and submission to the work of the Holy Spirit. Me and Maini was talking back there when I got here. She's in the back. I love you. Um, but she was talking about what, the, what am I preaching about? And I, I said, I'm going to talk about love and, and what the Spirit can empower us to. And, and, and it's kind of impossible. It, it's, it's improbable because most folk say they, they want God to be, have control of their lives. Jesus, take the will. Jesus can't take the will. You're driving a car like this. Jesus said, what, what part of the will? We got the will. So in order for this stuff to be uh, lived out in order for, for the work to be done, in order for us to be able to put on these clothes and, and this compassion and, and this kindness and this gentleness and, and meekness and, and all these things, we have to really submit. We got to take our hand off the wheel and say, Jesus, you're the Lord of my life. And I pray that your Holy Spirit continues to make me more like you. That's how we do it. We, we don't do it like this. Jesus can't take the, we, Jesus say, what will? So when we, we look at the next trait of of, of humility, uh, it talks about this being our everyday garment, but we recognize this calls us to modesty, uh, to having a humble opinion of oneself, of having a deep sense of one's own moral littleness. When we look at the trait of, of wearing gentleness, uh, we identify that we're called to a mildness of disposition. I, I, I would tell you this. And I'm praying in the Holy Spirit, and God is working in me. But th this means if, if you're driving, we pull out of church. We had this good sermon. The Holy Spirit kind of made us feel good. And we pull out somebody cut us off right when we get out there. Mildness of disposition might mean instead of giving them what we might want to give them, a, it might mean throwing up a peace sign and saying, God bless you. That, that is what this mildness of disposition means. It means to have a, a gentleness of spirit. It means to have some uh, meekness. It, it means to have some forbearance, which, success, which suggests self-control, restraint, and tolerance. Uh, when we look at this uh, concept of being cloaked with patience, uh, we, we have to comprehend that this entails both internal and self and external control in difficult circumstances. It speaks of being slow to avenge wrong and or injuries, uh, to being committed to long suffering. Uh, when we look at forgiveness, we we see that we are called to be tender-hearted, to not be quick to anger, but to be quick to pardon, uh, uh, to be agreeable, to always look toward reconciliation. And lastly, it, it tells us to put on this, this thing called love, and, and love binds them all together. So one of the things, if you read through the Greek or you, you read through them, they all kind of are interconnected. This, it all becomes one garment. So when, when they made this robe here, they, this is a velvet. So this velvet was its own kind of thing. But when, when they put it to this, it became together. So when the garment all came together, it was one garment. So all these things add together to complete the clothing that we're supposed to walk in. So when we walk out these doors... We might walk out the doors and we, we see a gentleman or, or, or a woman when, and they might have on a blue shirt and, and some blue slacks and, and they might have some tactical boots on and they might have a badge on their chest. You, you see that person, you identify them as a police officer. Uh, uh, when you go to the hospital, you, you see someone in blue scrubs and they might have on some, uh, some, some hospital type shoes and, and they have on a white coat. You, you identify these people as doctors. Uh, if you live in a place where they might have military people there, you might see someone in camouflage and tactical boots and, and their name across their chest and, and they might be identified as a member of the armed uh, forces. Uh, if you go to a nice restaurant and you see someone in the back and they, they got on a white uh, coat or a black coat and they have on a white hat, that person can be identified possibly as a chef. But I ask you, 
When, when, when we as Christians interact in the world, why can't we be identified? What, what, why do folks say, what are Christians? Why, they, we, why don't they have these identify? Where are the identifying marks? Where, where is the love? Where, where is the compassion? Where is, where is the grace? Where is, where is the forgiveness? Where is, what, where is it? So where's our uniform? So this, this is a word to say, let's just make sure our uniform's on, that, that we can be identified by who we are. There, there's a song that has been on my heart for about the last year, and the song says, they will know we are Christians by our love. It does not say they, they will know us, no, we are Christians by the way we vote. It, it, it doesn't say they, they will know we are Christians by our hypocrisy. Um, it, it doesn't say we are Christians by by the way we do anything, it says that our love, that this encompassing thing, that, that folk will see the love that we have, that they will see the compassion that we're walking in, and they will see the kindness, and they will see the humility, and, and they will see we are forgiving, and, and they will identify us by those traits. That's how they're going to recognize us. So just as you recognize a chef by his, his vest or whatever they call it, and, and his white hat, they're going to identify us by these traits that we have, but like I said, we don't have them within our own strength. We have them by the way and the working of the Holy Spirit, and really by the submission to the working of the Holy Spirit. So when I, when I ask the question, how could we accomplish the, the beloved community? We can't. It's not within our strength to do so. Uh, the only way we can do this, that we can have compassion and, and, and kindness and be overcome with it, right? So this is this concept of, of total depravity. The people have this misunderstood. Total depravity doesn't mean that we can't be right for a little bit. I could be good for about a week, right? I could be good for 24 hours, 48 hours, or, or whatever it might be. This concept of total depravity means at some point, I'm not going to be right. At some point, I'm going to fall. And that's why I'm totally depraved, because within myself, this, I don't have the strength to uphold myself. But it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's this process of regeneration. Regeneration means that, that God is doing the work in us, that, that God is, is, is almost like if you go to a good restaurant or you, you have a good cook making you some food. Right away when they, when they get the steak out or, or, or the, the, the tenderloin out, if you try to eat that thing right there, it ain't ready. Right? They, they got to season it, right? They got to put it in the oven, right? Or, or put it on the grill and, and get it ready and get, get all the things doing. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit says, until the coming of Jesus Christ, he's beginning a work in us. The work is already taking place. It can't take place if we don't submit, but the work is taking place. He's already putting some salt on it and, and, some, and some cumin on it and, and some pepper on it. And, and, and now it needs to go in the oven and sit for a while. And, and then after the oven, you might throw it on the grill. It, it's this process. This regeneration is a process that the Holy Spirit is doing within our ability to submit to the Holy Spirit. So, as I said before, um, this is not about us and the works we can do. So, don't hear me wrong. Hear, don't hear me wrong in saying this, that this is something that you have the strength to do and or I have the strength to do. This is us submitting to the work of the Holy Spirit and saying, God, he who began a good work in me. Because sometimes that good work don't seem like it's there. Like, God, I know you gave me some patience, but I don't have it today. But he still is putting a little bit more patience in you. God, man, I don't feel like being kind today. God, I'm not kind today. And yet, yet you have to remember that he's placing some more kindness in you. God, I don't want to forgive her. God, I don't want to forgive him. But, but, but you have to realize that he's putting a little bit more forgiveness in your heart. It's not done yet. What has, what, but what we have to do is be committed to submitting to the work of the Holy Spirit. We got to do this. Take our hands off the wheel and say, God, do the work. God, I, I know you, you started the work. God, I, I gave you my life. God, I, I, I said I understand that you're the Lord of my life. It's hard sometimes, but he who began a good work will be faithful to his completion. He who began a good work will continue to place in us compassion and, and kindness and humility and gentleness and forgiveness. He will make it our nature until the coming of Jesus Christ. To the glory of God. And in El Nombre del Padre, y Hijo, y del Espíritu Santo.
So as we leave from this place, know firstly that we do not leave alone, that we go together, but also we go with the work of the Holy Spirit, making us people of love and compassion and goodness and humility and most importantly, love. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>